So uh, I wanted to uh, start today talking a little bit, just, uh, but certainly not exhaustively, about how to analyze uh, uh, results that you get and compare them with experiment. And this is something that you, know, you really don't find uh, in textbooks very well or in review articles or anywhere. It's kind of like uh, the boring stuff that nobody wants to bother talking about. But if you don't do it right, then you're kind of wasting your time. So, so uh, you know, if you do a very sophisticated uh, uh, simulation and then you treat your results uh, in a really poor way, then, then you're kind of, uh, what, why bother doing, you know, the, 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 the high accuracy work if you don't know how to analyze the results. So I'm not going to cover really any kind of like statistics like fitting and so forth. You're going to have to just know that or learn that elsewhere. Uh, but again, a lot of the textbooks and a lot of the um, stuff that you learn in classes is really incomplete, uh, unfortunately, in that area as well. And I just don't have time to, uh, uh, there isn't really time in the, in the one-week school to really, really cover that as a, as a topic. So uh, you can talk to me individually if you have some questions or even in the future about that. But uh, I'm going to just talk about assuming that you know how to do uh, uh, how you know, you know, basic statistics and fitting, et cetera, and I'm not going to talk about that. So why do you need equations of state anyway? I mean, we're, the problem is, is we're doing calculations just at finite points. So, so we do a calculation at some volume or maybe at some pressure if you're using a technique that allows you to constrain the pressure, and then you just have a set of finite points. You don't have a continuous curve. Uh, so uh, that's the same thing with experiments, okay? Experiments uh, uh, generally, uh, uh, well, there's certain types of experiments where, where you might get some kind of continuous uh, property, but even in shock data, you tend to get, people don't realize this, but even in a shock experiment, you tend to get just one data point with each uh, uh, shot. So uh, uh, there are uh, designs that give you more than that, but generally that's, that's what you get. So, we, uh, so in the case of QMC, we Then we want to compare with experiment. Okay, so right off the bat, you want to know what the pressure is. And uh, the pressure generally is not one of the things that we compute as far as I know. I mean, at least it hasn't been discussed here. And the pressure? Yeah. In, QMC. In, in diffusion Monte Carlo, you directly get a pressure? I, I've never seen it. Okay, well, no one's talked about it here this week, so maybe you should talk about it later. But, yeah, uh, it's, I mean, if it's um, on something all electron, you just use the burial theorem. None of the codes that I'm familiar with print out a pressure, okay, so, yeah, so. Uh, pseudo-potential doesn't work. Okay, okay, well, but, but we're generally doing pseudo-potentials. Anyway, if there is a way to directly get a pressure, it would be nice to know about it. Anyway, the codes I'm familiar with don't, don't give you a pressure. Uh, so, uh, so even to get the pressure out, you need to do something with an equation of state. Uh, so what an equation of state is, is just the relationship between the energy, the volume, the pressure, and the temperature, okay, that's all it is. So, so given any three of those things, you can compute the fourth. And in addition, once you have the, uh, the basic equation of state, you can, can, can compute easily uh, thermodynamic functions like the enthalpy or the free energy, and uh, assuming you know the entropy. Uh, so, uh, well, if you have the full equation of state, then you can compute these, these other quantities. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so, so that's the basic idea. Uh, this shows, these are really DFT calculations here, but this is showing you, for example, for tantalum, what the thermal equation of state would look like just in terms of points. Each one of these things is actually a separate calculation. So you can imagine if you were doing this from, from, uh, from uh, you know, some kind of uh, temperature, uh, like a path integral Monte Carlo, I don't know, assuming you could do it at these temperatures. Uh, uh, you know, that's a lot of calculations there, but then you can represent them as these smooth curves, and in fact, the smooth curves here are really just come out of one function that relates uh, uh, energy, volume, pressure, and temperature. So that's the kind of thing uh, that, that I'm going to be talking about right now. So uh, I just want to give a few uh, uh, examples uh, just so you have some feeling for what we're talking about uh, a little bit more. Uh, here I showed you the energy versus the volume. If we look at the pressure versus the volume, then uh, this is really the fundamental thing you might want to be comparing with experimental data, because generally an experiment doesn't give you an energy, right? It gives you a, a, a pressure and a volume. And then the, te the temperature, okay? So this shows you the variation in the pressure as a function of volume, 
uh, at different temperatures from 0 to 10,000 Kelvin for tantalum computed with, with DFT, including uh, uh, an approximation to the inharmonicity. So, um, so this difference in, in uh, pressure at constant volume uh, as you change the temperature is called the thermal pressure. So as you increase the temperature, there's uh, a pressure uh, uh, from the, in, from the uh, in this case, primarily from the uh, uh, phonons, but there's also electronic excitations uh, that contribute to the pressure as well, especially since this is a metal. So uh, there are different equations that state out on the market. And uh, one of the confusions in comparing with experimental data is different people use different equations of state, but they have the same parameters. And then you can't really compare uh, the parameters that are fit to different equations of state uh, necessarily, uh, at least not uh, directly. So uh, this is the so-called Vinay equation of state, and, uh, or sometimes called the universal equation of state, which gives the pressure in terms of the uh, uh, compression here, the strain, just V over V0 to the one-third is a, essentially a linear strain. And uh, uh, B here is the bulk modulus. Uh, it's 1 over the compressibility. And then, uh, and then uh, B prime uh, is the uh, uh, pressure derivative of the bulk modulus. So very often, and usually these are often denoted as K, so this would be K0 and K0 prime. So very often you'll find tables of results, I mean many, many times even in paper abstracts from experiments that give a measurement of K or a measurement of K prime or both. And uh, if they were fit to a different equation of state, then you ne can't necessarily compare them directly with your result. But if you're worrying about 10%, it's not an issue. But if you're trying to you know, worry about something closer than that, uh, you need to worry about using the same equation of state. Uh, yeah? Just to ask, do you want to just tell everyone why couldn't you just do a polynomial? I, I, I'm going to say more about equations of state, but, but, uh, but maybe I don't have something particularly on that. Uh, why can't you just do a polynomial fit? Because uh, polynomials tend to wiggle around, and uh, you, you would need many more than uh, uh, these, these uh, 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 three parameters. Uh, you would need more than V0, K0, and K0 prime. Uh, you would need, because uh, it, it would be beyond, you know, a parabola or a third order fit or anything like that to fit all of the pressure points. These equations of state really go, go back, uh, you know, many decades and, and are really designed. In fact, I, the, I can give a whole hour talk on this, which I took all those slides out, you know, why these equations of state look like they do and so forth. But they're really designed to, uh, I'll say a little bit about the Binet equation of state with that regard, but they're really designed to... Uh, to look like equations of state look. So most things, it doesn't matter if you're looking at hydrogen or tantalum, uh, you know, the, the equation of state is similar, you know, until you have a phase transition. And I'll say something about that, too. So, uh, so uh, I want to also make the, the case that these equations of state are actually useful in, in, in a real physics way, not just as a way to fit data, which probably would not be true if you were just doing some arbitrary fit like a polynomial or something. So this Finet equation of state is designed to basically uh, have some kind of underlying uh, thing that looks like an inner atomic potential. I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But if you, assume you fit your results to a Finet equation of state. Let's say you knew nothing. Uh, all you know is you have your energies that you computed using DFT or QMC or whatever, and then you want to fit them to your equation of state. Okay, then you do your fit, uh, whatever your favorite program is. I use, for most of my stuff, I use Mathematica to do all of these fits. So I wrote my own little Mathematica notebooks. They're completely non, you know, user-friendly, non-transportable. You know, this is the problem. If you look on the web, you're not going to find good programs for fitting equations of state. Everybody just kind of does their own thing. But you, once you know the formula, you know, you can plug it into Mathematica and, do, and it'll do the fit for you. So let's say you've done your fit and then you look at the difference in the computed points uh, that you, you really computed and the value at the fit. Well, actually, there's some information in that. Because really, when, you, when nothing interesting happens, these residuals are, just look like noise or look like nothing. But here, you can see in the case of tantalum at zero temperature, uh, no matter what kind of uh, uh, equation of state I use, I use different equations of state, you see the same shape of residuals here. These residuals are in millivolts, so this goes plus or minus 30 millivolts uh, per atom. And you see that there's this kind of uh, uh, regular... Uh, 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 behavior of the residuals from the equation of state. So you could just say, well, the equation of state's not that accurate, 
or it just doesn't work that well. But you see all the equations of state are like that. And, and from this, I actually found a phase transition. So this is kind of teaches a little lesson that you can learn something from, you know, from something very simple, like just fitting your data, you know, something that I hadn't realized was there. It, it, after I saw that, I looked at the band structure in more detail. And so this is the, uh, you know, we're plotting here just the cone sham eigenvalues. And on Monday, I talked about how these different symbols are different points in the Bruin zone. So if we look at low pressure and high pressure, uh, they're, they're both metallic, but you see there's a, a change in the topology of the, of the bands. You see like this set of bands over here is above the Fermi level, they're below over here, and above over here, and below over here. There's basically a topological change in the electronic structure. If you plotted the Fermi surface, which I don't show you here, it looks totally different at low pressure and high pressure. And this happens at one particular pressure where these, where these uh, uh, bands cross from uh, below, from above the Fermi level to below the Fermi level, and basically, okay, the Fermi level is the, the, the level where the electron states are occupied. So above, above. Is there a structural transition? No, this is uh, uh, isostructural cubic BCC tantalum. So there's nothing interesting happening here in the crystal structure. Can you go back to the previous card and tell everyone how did you see a phase transition? Well, the fact that these aren't just zero, I didn't show you an example, but actually maybe this shows you. So if you fit only the low pressure data to, the, uh, to one of these equations of state, you see you essentially get zero residuals. So only when you fit, when you include this data at higher pressures, you see that it doesn't fit. Okay, so basically what's showing here is just I'm not getting a good fit to the equation of state. If you look though to the original results here, uh, these are the uh, calculated points, and this is the fitted equation of state. I mean, the line seems to go right through the points. You see the energy scale here is Rydberg's. Of course, it's in different units than the other thing, but this is like one Rydberg, so that's like, uh, that's like uh, uh, 13 volts. Okay, so that's like 13 volts per atom. And, and yet, this scale here is millivolts, so this is 30 millivolts per atom, okay? So it's really fitting very, very well, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's sensitive to this change in the... And so this has been found experimentally now, since then, that there is a, this electronic topological phase transition in tantalum. Okay, so once you have this kind of information, you can move ahead and you can uh, uh, calculate... I always enjoy doing this, but, you know, most people are probably bored to tears when they see these things. But, but uh, I look, like looking at this is the energy at, 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 at zero pressure as a function of temperature. This is the, the uh, K prime, you know, bulk modulus, the volume. So this is the thermal, you know, the derivative of this gives you the thermal expansivity. And uh, so these are the parameters of that equation of state then as a function of uh, temperature for tantalum. And we can just go on and on analyzing this and, and studying it. So people used to think that the thermal pressure uh, was basically a constant and you, a, a, as a given temperature. And you see it is pretty constant, but it does vary some, especially as you go up in pressure. And, uh, but over some limited range of volumes, uh, you know, it's pretty constant, the thermal pressure. And so we can actually then plot the thermal pressures versus temperature at different at different volumes, and you see they all behave pretty similarly. And finally, in the end, we can just get an average thermal pressure out as a function of temperature, and you see it really fits pretty well. And, and, and then we end up with a very simple equation of state uh, for tantalum that actually, you know, is within experimental error, you know. So this is the whole equation of state, uh, you know, it's better than plus or minus 5 GPA, you know, over 10,000 Kelvin temperature range and up to 35% compression and it's pretty incompressible material, so we're talking about a high uh, range of pressure. And basically, this is the whole thing right there. So you can, you, you, know, you can go through this kind of analysis, people that do shockwave studies or people that try to simulate uh, you know, impact behavior of materials or whatever. I mean, this is the kind of basic information that they want to know, and they want it in a simple form that they can use it. And I'm going to say more about other forms and other you know, complications as well. Okay, so uh, I guess um, um, there's a whole literature, you know, of boring papers on equations of state, and this is another, you know, attempt of doing an accurate uh, equation of state. Uh, let's see. So I mentioned about the Binet equation already, and it, it basically it looks like this when you express it in terms of the bulk modulus and, and, and K prime and x, x here is the strain rel relative to V0. This is a very common equation of state that you'll see in the literature, which is the Birch equation or the Birch-Murnahan equation. 
And, um, and uh, uh, you see here it, it looks different. Uh, I'm going to compare it in a minute. Uh, it has a different measure of the strain, basically. Uh, it's a polynomial also in this finite strain. And uh, uh, one of the interesting things about this equation of state is that if you set k prime equal to 4, then all these higher order terms uh, go away. And so, um, and so very often you'll see in the experimental literature in particular, you know, we assumed k prime equals 4, and then we got this as the bulk modulus and so forth. So the reason they do that is they just don't have enough data to constrain all of the parameters. Okay, so, so uh, uh, people uh, argue, they actually go to meetings and argue about the value of k prime for some material, you know. So you can get involved in that too, you know, if this is exciting to you. So, um, so, uh, um, but, but there's another interesting point here, interesting if you're like me anyway, is that uh, all of these parameters are, are correlated with each other and nobody ever publishes, you know, the correlation matrices from their fits. So, so, uh, so if an experiment uh, gives you k and k prime, you know, they could have chosen a different k prime and then they would have gotten a different k and it would have fit their data almost just as well. So, you know, so these are all, you know, issues you have to worry about if you're trying to deal with uh, comparing with experiment. Uh, Vinay equation of state again. Oh, so this is just where Vinay originally uh, uh, derived this uh, expression. Uh, he really just started with this kind of idea of kind of an interatomic potential with like a exponential kind of repulsion and some kind of binding energy and then he expressed it in terms of a delta E binding energy and some kind of length. And so that's really where this equation of state comes from and so it really does look something like uh, like uh, an equation of like an uh, interatomic potential underlying the, uh, the Vinay equation of state, and that's why it works so well. So you can see this looks nothing like, you know, a parabola or something like this. So that, this is why people use these kind of equations of state, because they look something like the way atoms interact with each other. And uh, if you look at the uh, equivalent quantity for the Birch equation, you see it really doesn't look like uh, an interatomic potential. It has a maximum, and then it goes down again. Most Interatomic potentials don't look like that, though I guess, no, usually they just, you know, go off to infinity. But, uh, you know, so, so there's kind of an underlying uh, uh, problem with the Birch equation. Uh, though you see if you look at the part that's under compression, you know, maybe it's just fine, okay? And if you take just like as an example, if you just take a given bulk modulus in K prime and compare different equations of state, uh, you see they agree pretty well at low compression. So there's no way to take low pressure data, uh, say even up to a megabar really. Uh, uh, you know, well it depends on the material, but say, say uh, you know, a few percent uh, compression or a uh, five percent compression or something, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between one equation of state and another. But if you have really high uh, compressibility material like hydrogen where you can compress it by a factor of ten or something, then you may start to figure out uh, there's a difference between different equations of state. So this scale here is going up to factor five compression. So it's starting at one here on the right and going to point two on the left. Is that true? I can't read my own slide. Is that a zero point two? Yeah, okay. So it's only at a factor five compression you're seeing these big differences in equations of state. So even when you do almost a factor of two compression, which is, you know, a tremendous pressure for most materials, the different equations of state give you basically the same results on this scale. Um, now, uh, so let's make some contact with QMC. So I already uh, spoke about this a little bit on Monday, so I want to talk about it again uh, within, you know, now we're talking about a different issue, because, and so I'll show something a little different. But one of the examples uh, that I showed on, uh, on Monday to kind of motivate uh, 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 doing QMC uh, was uh, Ken Esler uh, and, 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 and some of us um, did this uh, uh, set of diffusion Monte Carlo calculations on uh, cubic boron nitride and the idea here was to get a really accurate equation of state that could be used as a fundamental pressure standard. And the issue is, is that there are no fundamental pressure standards. So everybody uh, does their experiment calibrated on something like the lattice constant of gold or or, 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 or a fluorescence peak in ruby, uh, which is calibrated against something else, which is calibrated against something else, and ultimately you run through the, you know, the house of cards and you find out there's nothing there, you know, that anything is calibrated on, you know, I mean, uh, so there is no fundamental high pressure standard. Now, I'm overstating that case because 
There are some experiments where people have done Brillouin scattering and static compression experiments and getting the elastic constants and the, and the, um, and the uh, volume and, and uh, calibration and, that they've, and, and assuming an equation of state, okay, so that's why it's also not fundamental, assuming an equation of state, uh, they have come up with something that's at least self-consistent as a pressure scale. And the other thing I've learned, which I'm going to show you in a minute, is experimentalists tend to be very good at guessing things. So, so even when there's nothing underlying it, you know, it turns out that it's really not that bad, you know. So, uh, so uh, we get, it's not like we get a pressure scale that's very different from what experimentalists have used. It's actually quite similar. But anyway, so, uh, so basically the idea is that we have the uh, uh, pressure at volume and temperature is, is the pressure at, say, room temperature plus some kind of thermal pressure. Uh, and, then, uh, and then how are we going to treat that? So, so, uh, so Ken uh, did uh, QMC calculations on the cubic boron nitride. The reason that cubic boron nitride is of interest as a pressure standard, it, and I think I actually have a picture of it here. Oh, I don't. Okay. Uh-oh. Go back and. Um, I, I guess I don't have a picture. Oh. I guess I don't have a picture of it here. But uh, anyway, it's 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 uh, it, it only has uh, uh, it's cubic, so you just have to measure one lattice parameter to to, to get the the the, X, the structure from X-ray, and then it has one Raman mode. So it also is very unreactive, so you can use it in a uh, as a pressure calibrant in a high pressure experiment, and it won't react with the other things in your in your sample cell, and, uh, and it's stable over a very wide range of pressure and temperature, so it doesn't have any phase transitions, uh, and so it's a good thing to use as a pressure standard. So, uh, so, uh, so he did uh, uh, with us uh, QMC calculations to get the zero temperature uh, 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 equation of state, and then we used uh, density functional theory to calculate the phonons to um, do the finite temperature part. And then we used a combination of DFT and QMC calculations to calculate uh, the Raman frequency and to get its uh, temperature dependence as well. So using, in principle, using the lattice constant and the Raman frequency, you can then get the pressure and the temperature. So, uh, so for example, uh, if we use the Binet form for the uh, 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 equation of state for the part that was done with uh, diffusion Monte Carlo, and then the thermal part was fit to the uh, phonons, and, and in this course, there just wasn't time to talk about lattice dynamics and, and, uh, and uh, density functional perturbation theory and so forth. But that's what we did to get the, uh, the phonon frequencies. And from that, we could get the phonon free energy within the quasi-harmonic approximation and get a, uh, a thermal pressure. And so then that was fit where we take the Debye temperature as a function of compression and temperature. And, uh, and that's basically, uh, you know, we have a closed form, simple form for the equation of state. So uh, this shows an example of what happens then. This is the, uh, uh, um, well, this is actually our final result here shown on the left, where uh, these are experimental data, the black points here, and then this is our equation of state shown in the curve. So you can see it fits the experimental data, but plus we get uh, results up to much higher uh, pressures as well. Um, if we look here uh, on the right, uh, these, and I talked about this a little on Monday, but I'll just talk about it again. So, so uh, you see there's actually results for different pseudopotentials here. So these different colored band regions are the, are, are, are the pressure relative, you know, the deviation of the pressure from here uh, for different pseudopotentials. So you see that the pseudopotential issue is actually, once you start doing diffusion Monte Carlo, that in a sense, it's going to be one of your main issues. I mean, you can do the most beautiful DMC calculation in the world, but the final result is going to depend on the quality of your pseudopotential. So in this study, we actually did some all-electron calculations where we didn't have any pseudopotential, and, and, and we corrected basically the pseudopotential results, uh, which is shown here in the middle slide, uh, uh, that all the different pseudopotential, once they're corrected, give the same uh, 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 final results in these colored bands. So we were able to get like plus or minus 5 GPA at a terapascal in our final equation of state. Uh, but uh, I think that, uh, you know, one of the areas, if you want to do, uh, you know, method development within QMC, you know, is to find, and, and, and there's been some work done by, uh, you, you know, Dave Separley and others, but, you know, to, to find ways to, 
either do all electron or to do, uh, to do um, um, you know, better pseudopotentials. Okay, and I mentioned that we did the um, uh, Raman mode as well, and this is kind of an interesting, I don't know what happened over here, sorry about that. Anyway, um, it looks like there's a different slide underlying. Anyway, um, just ignore the man behind the curtain. So uh, if you look here, you see the uh, energy versus uh, Raman mode uh, coordinate, and you see it doesn't look like a perfect parabola, so this is anharmonicity. And uh, so this gives you a temperature dependence of the Raman frequency, and we actually calculated these points with QMC. And this is actually an interesting case to compare with DFT, because I've talked a lot about, uh, you know, how, uh, well, whatever. Let me just show you. So, so, uh, so the uh, uh, DFT frequency that you get, if you just do a harmonic uh, calculation with, say, density functional perturbation theory, you get 1033 uh, wave numbers. And the experiment is 1054. So really, that's pretty good. I mean, uh, most people would be happy with, uh, you know, 20 wave numbers out of 1,000, you know, as a prediction of a frequency. Uh, but look what happens if we actually do DFT and we treat the anharmonicity better. It, the agreement with the experiment gets worse. So then we get 1,000 wave numbers, okay? So, so, you know, this is a case where, you know, you want to stop while you're ahead, I guess. But, I mean, you know, the better calculation you're doing, the worse result you're getting, okay? But that's because it's not harmonic, okay? So if we, I mean, that's because DFT is not perfect, right? So if we do look at DMC, we see that uh, when we did the initial harmonic calculation with DMC, we actually got a worse agreement with experiment than DFT gave, okay? But when we treated the inharmonicity properly, uh, we were within 10 wave numbers of experiment. So, so you really need to, you know, you can't just improve your approximation or your calculation in one area without looking at the whole picture. So, I mean, here you need to treat the inharmonicity better and you need to also, you know, treat the electronic the errors are not commutative, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then add it to say the DMC or the yes. DMC or something, but that, none of that would work, right? Right, 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 right. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I mean, and in fact here, you know, so yes, that's true, right, right. So, so the, I mean, the DFT harmonic is larger than the anharmonic, and the same thing yeah. for the DMC. Not that yeah, 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 but not by the same amount, yeah. But it's about 20? Yeah, yeah, I guess 24. Oh, maybe it's not that different. It's within the okay. hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but. Ron, since you stop, can yeah. you tell now, imagine as an experimentalist who does Raman measurement yeah. and measures X-ray diffraction. Can you just tell what should happen? Why is this useful? Well, yeah, except that, uh, well, as you know, we kind of... No, just, know, why just is this doing this? How it, which would work. Oh, how it should work? Yeah, no, just basically, because it's not obvious to anyone. Really. Okay, well, how it should work is we should have published a program that lets you compute these things for the experiments, but we didn't, okay? Just tell, tell everybody you know, what happens. What do you actually use this for? Oh, I thought I said. So, so, so uh, I said it very quickly. But uh, so now you can measure the Raman frequency and you can measure the lattice constant in the experiment and you can get out the pressure and the temperature in principle, okay? But none of the reviewers actually made us do anything other than publish the equations for this. So no experimentalists actually use it because they would actually have to write a little program, you know, a 10-line program. So we need to put a little 10 line program on the web, you know, that lets people do this calculation. But so what you should say is that the experimentalists do not measure pressure. They take a little chip of something, put it inside with the sample, and then measure the Raman frequency. That's the only way they get pressure. That's why they need this calibration. Right, right, exactly, right. And then this can be cross-calibrated against other calibrants like fluorescence in ruby or lattice constant of gold or whatever you want and you know in principle uh, you know this could be the formation of, 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 of a whole uh, uh, pressure scale. So, uh, so fit your DFT and QMC results to equations of state and do it carefully okay uh, and I think much can be learned from the equation of state the parameterizations are useful for comparing with experiment and so forth. And actually, uh, Burkhardt showed in his uh, talk also, uh, f shown in a different uh, way, you know, uh, a, a different form, but really the same thing, that comparing equations to state with, with very high pressure experiments, for example, uh, you know, has been an uh, area of great uh, interest and controversy in the high pressure community, 
uh, and uh, particularly in, in, in laser shock studies and so forth. Okay, so that's, uh, I, I'm gonna say, that's the end of this uh, uh, portion. Are there any questions on, on this? Sure. Uh, well, the energy, uh, let's see, is the, um, the, 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 these are all just uh, plotted at the same zero here. So zero is plotted at the center here. Yeah, no, I, the DFT energies are very, very different. So actually that would be ins instructional in itself. That DFT does a decent idea of, of the shape, but the total energy is, you know, way off. But any other questions? So as you have included actually the So I was wondering sure, if there might be some chance, like some kind of quasi particle besides polar, like polar, polar, and those lattice fibers in the direction of kind of. So yeah, there's certainly other quasi-particles in the system, but they're not going to, at least not in, on this scale, affect the equation of state. So they would be at a much lower energy scale. So, uh, so um, you know, generally speaking, you don't see those kind of things uh, like polarons and so forth. Uh, the question was, uh, do other quasi-particles affect the equation of state? So generally, not. But, uh, but, the, but, but, but they do in the case of magnetic systems. So you see uh, uh, contributions from spins fluctuations and spin waves in equations of state. And we've done a lot of little work on that, but that's actually a very interesting area. Even if you look at just iron, so BCC iron at zero pressure, uh, if you look at, uh, if you do the best possible, you know, uh, DFT calculation you can do, uh, the thermal expansivity and elastic constants are way off and, and, and they have a, a big anomaly at the Curie temperature. So we, did, we wrote a paper on that using an approximate way of trying to treat that, but that, that's an interesting area as well. Produced by OCE Atlas Digital Media at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign.